I'm John Buchanan, and in this video we're going to take our orchestral programming course, mini course, on one more step. This is part four. So, so far what we've done is to look at some basic sort of string programming. What we've then done is to develop that string programming into more of a kind of an ensemble arrangement. And then we took a step back last time out to learn how to build a template. And what I've done here is to take our original string parts and I've imported them into our template project. So I'll show you exactly what we're looking at. So when we left our template, it looked like this and we had created groups of instruments that we wanted to work with. And now what we're going to do is to begin the process of taking our arrangement on by populating a few more of these tracks and beginning to see how a template can really help us. So what I've done is to import the string parts into the strings longs folder. And I've done that literally just by importing from another project, which is a really useful way of being able to get information from one project to another. So effectively what I've got now is all of the string parts now existing within the strings longs track stack. And remember what that means is that all of these individual parts are being routed to an auxiliary bus where all of them belong together. And it sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing to say is I've made a track stack called strings longs. And in fact, if we just make all this a little bit bigger, we'll be able to see these names completely. So it's obviously up to me to decide how much of the screen I want to give over to this tracks area. But for now, I think it's useful to be able to see this all quite clearly. I've made a track stack called strings longs, but I've also got one called string shorts. And whilst my first violin and my cellos and my double basses are all longs, that isn't true for the second violins and the violas. Now, the reason why that I choose to separate those within my template and lots of other composers do as well is because the demands and the kind of approach to processing short and long strings can vary. And the best example of that is in the reverb choices that you might make for both long and for short strings. So what I'm really keen to do is to move the violin two and viola parts into my short strings stack. Now there are a couple of ways I could do that. The first thing I could do would simply be to grab the violin two long patch, which is actually misnamed because it's, it's playing short samples and to move it down here. And that would be definitely one way that I could go. But actually I do want a violin two long track because I might decide to move back to long articulations later on. So rather than actually just moving it, what I'm actually gonna do is to take the data from these two lines and I'm gonna copy them down to here or move them down to here to violin two and to viola um, as well. So effectively I'm just moving them from one stack to another. And so long as I set up instruments for them, then I'm in good shape. Now I could just come and load the sounds that I was using before, but I can also use my mixer. So if I come here, I can see that this is the violin long two patch. And what I want to do is to use it here where the short violin two patch is. So, so long as I copy this instrument to here, and if we do the same thing with the violas as well, I'm literally just holding down. In fact, look, I've rushed that. So let's just do that again for the violas as well. I'm literally just holding down option at the same time as dragging. I can copy those instrument choices over here. And because they were set up to play short articulations, because that's what they were playing in the wrong stack, of course, it's brought over the articulations for them as well. So now what I've done is to separate the long and the short strings and they're now playing back within the correct stacks. And of course, if I press play, we'll be able to hear them. Okay, so there are a couple of things to say. Now that we've got this sort of sound coming together in this way, we could start thinking about adding effects. Now you'll remember from the templates video that one of the advantages of building a template is that we can create effects that are specific to each stack. And that's really useful when it comes to printing the individual mixes of your projects. So if you were ever asked to supply um, sort of stems, which is a really common thing for mixing within the sort of music for media world, it's nice to be able to say, okay, yeah, my string longs are being printed separately from my string shorts, from my winds, from my brass, from my percussion. They're all separate stems. And so effectively, it's useful for us to have effects for each of those stems as well, so that we have the option to print a wet long string mix and a dry one if we need 
into and for us not to have to think about effects that are being shared across a number of different instruments. Now what we did within the um, building a template video was to assign a number of auxiliary buses for the long strings. So I could now assign the first of those individual effects. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of these tracks, including the violin two and the violas, even though they're now not playing a long articulation. And I'm going to turn up the reverb sends or the auxiliary sends from those tracks. The only question now is what are they assigned to? Where is that send being sent? Well, you will remember that what we did was to hide the effect sends for each of our stems. So if I press the hide button, we get a chance to see the auxiliary routings that were created for the long strings. So what I'm going to do is to click on the first of those, which is here, and I can see that as of yet, I have not yet assigned an individual effect into here. This would be the right time to do it. So I've labeled it strings, longs, reverb one. Okay, well, let's add a reverb here. So what I'm going to do is to come to Space Designer, I'm going to fire up a nice long bright hall maybe. Uh, let's come in here and see if we can find something large and hauly. And what I'm going to do is to choose, I don't know, well it's kind of irresistible not to choose the dream hall. Um, however, I'm going to resist that temptation and choose a fine hall instead. Hmm. Okay, so there we are. What we've now got is a reverb set up on this bus and we've got all of these sounds being sent to that reverb. Now to check what that reverb sounds like, what I can do is to solo that reverb. That's such a fine haul. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is to uh, put it in with the actual string parts as well. And there it is, there's our lovely reverb. Now, of course, this is a really important point. That reverb has been added to the long strings, but not to the shorts. And if everything I've said so far on this course makes sense, you will understand why. And if you don't, that's fine. Let's have a little recap very quickly. The long strings have got their own set of auxiliary sends, and they are here. Because I've pressed the unhide button, we have a chance to see those, and I've just assigned a reverb to them. They are also part of the track stack for the long strings. They are all being assigned to bus number two, which means that everything, the long strings and those effects, are being folded down into the track stack that is the long strings world. And as a result of that, none of that affects the long uh, the short strings. So if I wanted to add auxiliary effects to the short strings, I'd have to do what I've done for the long strings, which is to create a set of auxiliary sends. And I can do that really easily. I can select all of these. And what I'm gonna do is to look at the last number that I used for the long strings, bus number 74. And what that means is that I could come into here come to the buses, come to bus number 75, and set up, again, five separate auxiliaries for these individual tracks. So we can just do this sequentially, one after another. So that one was 76, 77, 78, and 79. And every time I add a new one, I get a new auxiliary effect over here. And by default, at the moment, these are being routed to the stereo output, but we know how to change that in a moment. So what I could do would be to say, this is going to be strings, shorts, reverb one. I'm going to copy that name. And then what I can do is to paste it there and just call it reverb two. I'm going to paste it there and maybe call that reverb three. And then what I'm gonna do is to paste it here as well. And I'm just gonna call that effects four because I don't know what that's going to be yet maybe some delay maybe something else and I'm going to paste it there and that will be reverb number five or effect number five okay so what we've now got is a set of auxiliaries for the short strings too and then what I want to do is to make sure that they 
are all being added to that stack. So what I'm going to do is to create tracks for them by control clicking. Now I've got tracks for them. And now what I'm going to discover is because I had the short string stack open, they have been added to the auxiliary routings for the short strings as well. OK, so all I need to remember to do now is to select these tracks, make them hideable. And now when I press the hide button, they will vanish just like the effects do for the long strings. And again, if I unhide them, I get a chance to see those. So what I could do if I wanted to would be to copy this fine haul across to my first effect slot for the short strings as well. And that means that I can access that effect from these sends, but maybe I want a little bit less reverb on the short strings than I've got on the long strings, for instance. So now I've got an independent effect send for those short strings. Now, if all of that felt like a rush or it didn't make sense, go and watch the templates video because I've gone through that with a really fine tooth comb. So hopefully that will make some sense. OK, so we've now got reverb added to both lots of our strings. For now, we'll keep the hide button unhidden so that we can actually see, so that took some thinking about, so we can actually sort of see these effect sends and we'll actually see the level coming into them from both of these sets of sounds. <laughs> OK, and we can hear that reverb tail really nicely. So now I will hide the effects. Remember, to toggle those on and off, all I need to do is to press the hide button. And similarly, if what I want to do is to hide the parts that exist within the long strings or the short strings, all I've got to do is to close down their stacks. So we've got our strings, and they are assigned into the longs, into the shorts, and we've set up a reverb bus for both of those. Just one for now. Remember, we've got five effects we could choose from, and at the moment, we're just using the first of those sends. Where might we go next? Well, rather than mixing and thinking about more reverbs, I'm interested to flesh out the arrangement of this a little bit more. So what we're going to do actually next is to turn to woodwinds. I'm going to open up this stack, and we're going to discover, of course, that what I did when building this template was to assign tracks for, although not yet instruments, to piccolos, flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons. And as ever, there's a winds duplicate if I decide that I want to duplicate this track, but with all of the same assignment into this stack, um, in case I decide later on that there's another sound I might want to add into here. Now, I'm particularly interested to see what happens when we double some of these short articulations, the violins and the violas, to a couple of wind voices as well. And we're going to start by copying the violin part two down to the flutes. OK, now a couple of things to say about that. Firstly, it's greyed out. And the reason for that is this track is not yet on. So I'm going to turn it on. Also, it's now named incorrectly because, of course, I've copied it down from here. So I'm going to use Shift Option N. And what that's going to do is to assign the track name to this region. And then, of course, it's going to need its own color. Now, I've chosen brown for the winds. So it would make sense that I make the region that color as well. Fine. All good, except that, of course, we're not going to hear any flutes yet because I haven't actually assigned an instrument to this track. So what I'm going to do is to come to the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Now, I'm aware of the fact that this library actually exists in three different forms. There's the Discover version, then there's a Core library, and then there's the Pro library. And what we've done with the strings is to use the Pro library. And what that does is to give me all of the same sounds as the Core library, except that I don't get, within the Core library, all of the microphone sort of um, opportunities to decide whether I want to balance the close mics with the outriggers and so on and so forth. For the winds, what I'm going to do, for those of you using the core library, is I'm going to switch to the core. And I can see that I can do that. If I've got access to both of the versions um, that exist on my computer, I can literally just switch between them here. So for the winds, we'll stay in core world. And then what I can do is to come into here and then come and find those sounds. So we've got strings, brass, and then here are the winds. So for my flutes, what do I want? Do I want a solo flautist or do I want a, an ensemble of three players? Now, what that literally means is that one set of these samples has been recorded with one person, the lead flautist, if you like, the sort of solo or the leader of that um, orchestral section. And the second set of sounds has been recorded with three separate players all playing the same note. So by selecting flutes A3, I get three players, but they're all still going to play the same note. It's just going to give me more of an ensemble sound. Again, in string world, that's the difference between a solo 
string player and an ensemble of eight or 16 or however many players have been recorded to make up that orchestral um, sort of sound. So it's going to sound different. Let's try them both. So if I load the solo flautist, which I can do just by selecting flute and then pressing load, then effectively what happens is I get one person playing these notes. And because I've copied across the short strings, it's going to be the staccatissimo um, articulation that I'm going to be interested in again here as well. This is our super short staccato um, articulation. In fact, even shorter than staccato. Um, so that's going to give me the notes. The only thing is I need to think a little bit about octaves as well. Are these notes going to play back or are these beyond the range of what a flautist can actually play? Well, let's find out. I'm going to solo this part and press play. Okay, so I can see that the second note of this phrase, buh, 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 that low note is actually off the bottom of the range of what a flute can play. And these keyboard ranges here are showing me what we're actually listening to. And I can see that that second note is too low. But also, this isn't the range of the flute I'm interested in anyway. I want this kind of breathy, airy kind of sound. So what I'm going to do is to take this part and I'm going to press Shift and Option and Up. And what that's going to do is to transpose everything up an octave. So I've got this part doubled now, but it's an octave higher than it is in the second violins. And that sounds like this. Okay, now remember what we did when we programmed this uh, second violin part was to create this relationship between the first note and the second note. So effectively, if I look at the velocities for these, what I have a chance to see is that we've got a loud note and a quieter one, a loud note and a quieter one. And in the strings, that feels quite good. In the flutes, what we're getting is a lot of that first note and not a lot of the second. OK, so what I want to do is to change the dynamic balance between the loudest notes and the quietest notes so that they're closer together so that we get a little bit of this. Now, of course, it makes sense that that wouldn't be consistent across violins and flutes. Why on earth would it be? So it makes sense that there's going to be something I'm going to need to do to this part, even if it's a doubling of the notes to make it feel right for the flute. So to narrow that dynamic range, what I'm going to do to come here, I'm going to control an N on that file, which is going to make that um, transposition a permanent one. So those notes have now jumped the octave. But what I'm also keen to do is to restrict the dynamic range of this part. And in fact, I'm going to restrict it by 50%. So what that's going to do is to basically narrow the distance between the loudest and the quietest notes. And again, to see that actually become part of the file, I need to control N to normalize the sequence parameters. And what that's done is it's brought all of that dynamic range closer together, but it actually has made everything quieter. So having done that, I'm going to select everything and I'm going to turn the velocities back up more or less to where they were. And what that's going to mean is that the loudest notes are going to be as loud as they were. The quieter notes are now going to be louder than they were before. OK, and that's feeling a bit better to me from a dynamics perspective. Let's just hear that with the second violins. OK, that's really nice. There's a lot of energy in that. OK, so now let's come back to the flutes and see what it would sound like if we had three players rather than one player playing that part. So I think it's the next patch. Sure enough. So what I've done is to just move on the next patch. I'm going to need to reselect that articulation. That sounds like this. Mm. Now, what's interesting about this is because it's reinforced by three players, actually now the dynamic range feels too consistent. Well, OK, I could undo the steps that I have just made. But what I could also do would actually to build increased dynamic range back into this part. So if I take it back up to, I don't know, let's say 150 percent, what's now going to happen is that the, again, the gaps between the loudest and the quietest notes are going to be wider than they were before. So I can be constantly using the relationship between those notes to decide how I want these things to work in terms of their overall dynamic range. Let's have a listen.
Okay, so, so far, what we've done is to double that part, we've taken it up the octave, but at the moment, of course, the timing of the second violin part is exactly the same in the flutes. Now, it would be really great if when I was working with an orchestra, then that locking of the rhythm was as precise as it is in the uh, sort of context of me literally being able to do this with MIDI and copying one part to another. But of course the reality is that we're human beings and orchestral players are human beings. So of course the timing of the flautist is not going to be the same as the second violins whilst they're going to be responding to the same sort of conductor um, beating their baton. Nevertheless there's going to be some variation. So what could I do about that to just bring a little bit of discrepancy to the way that these notes are going to play? Now this introduces us to a really interesting interesting concept, which is the idea of MIDI transform. What I have a chance to do when I'm using MIDI transform is to basically select a whole bunch of notes and to basically almost algorithmically change them in a few little ways. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. I'm going to turn off the MIDI outlight because I don't want to be triggering notes while I'm doing this. And then what I'm going to do is to draw a box around all of these notes so that they're all selected. Now, if I come to functions, I have a chance to come into MIDI transform, which is here. And what I can do here is to choose a whole series of transformational MIDI processes. So for instance, I could fix velocity, which basically means they'll all become the same velocity. I could create a crescendo where I've got a ramp of velocities all moving upwards. There's a whole bunch of things here that I could try out. But what I'm interested in is humanize. And what humanize is going to do is to allow me to randomly process a couple of things about these notes. And specifically what I have a chance to do is to randomize their position. Now then, what that's going to do, of course, is it's going to move them out of time up to however much I select within this area. Now I need to be careful. If I go and select one here, that can randomize their movement up to a bar in either direction of their current position. That's gonna be far, far, far too much. What I'm interested in doing is just randomizing them by a few ticks, a few little frames, a tiny amount, just to give a slight difference between the timing of these notes compared to the timing of the second violins. So what I'm gonna do is to take this up to about 12, maybe 12 frames. So that's just gonna give us a little bit of movement. Remember, that means up to 12. So most of these notes won't move as much as that, but they might move early, they might move late. What I can also do is to randomize their velocities a little bit. Now again, I've sort of taken velocity in hand, but because of the way that I've done my processing, I've now got a flat line of the loudest velocities because they all got pushed up to 127. So I'd like to just make those a bit less peaky, if that makes sense. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a randomization of velocity up also to about 12. And if I want to, I have a chance within Human Eyes to randomize the length of these notes. Well, I'm not too worried about that because remember they're effectively one shot samples. So their length for a short articulation is gonna make any difference it would make some difference if I was using long articulations. Hopefully that makes sense too. So I'm gonna leave that exactly as it is. It will change the length a little bit, but only by 10 frames. And then what I'm gonna do is to select and operate, which kind of sounds quite, I don't know, dangerous and medicinal somehow. But nevertheless, we can see what's happened is that the velocities have been randomized for sure. And probably if we hone in on these notes, we're going to see that their timing is a little bit out too. That one certainly looks a little bit earlier, for instance, than this one, which is a bit closer to its line. So hopefully what we've now got is a tiny bit more sense that the violins and the flutes, whilst they're playing the same notes, have got a little bit more independence. Yeah, I like that. Now then, let's put that in with the whole mix. Okay, so that's giving us this nice air. Now it's also worth bearing in mind that the flutes, in terms of their range, could play another octave higher if we wanted them to. That would still be within their range. That would sound like this. Okay, now there are a couple of things I could do. Because I've got three players playing this part, remember if this was a solo flute, what I'm about to suggest would sound weird because 
if we were using a solo note, really, we can only ask a flautist to play one note at a time. But we can slightly cheat here because we could, in theory, take away this transposition for a moment, come back into our region, and we might decide that when the arrangement gets a little bit denser later on, we might decide we're going to select all of these notes. This is a little trick I use all the time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to option and copy them up one semitone. That will sound disastrous. Then I'm going to transpose them up an octave using shift, option, and up, and then using option and down, I'm going to transpose them down one semitone. So now they are an octave higher than the original notes. Now, yes, the answer to your question that you're screaming at YouTube right now is that means that all three of these players are going to play all three of these notes, and all three of those players are going to play all three of those notes an octave up. Not ideal, but uh, we'll just see if we can get away with this. What I'm definitely going to do is turn the velocities down of the upper octave, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so by itself, the flute line now sounds like this. was an anti-climax because I turned the velocities down too much. Let's hear that again. Okay, it's kind of nice, isn't it? So we've suddenly got that opening up into that upper octave, and it's kind of making me think that what we could also do would be to extend it with a piccolo, which is another octave higher for that section, but we'll hold off on that for now. So we've got some flutes, which are doubling the second violins. I'm just wondering whether or not we might double the clarinets too with the violas. So we can repeat a really similar process. Again, because I'm weird about it, I'm going to make sure that they're labeled as clarinets. I'm going to make sure that they're the same color as the flutes because these things matter. Oh yes. Then what I'm going to do is to come over here and load an instrument for them. And again, we're going to dive in here. And again, we're going to make sure that we're staying in the core version of this library for our winds. And then what we'll do is to drop down into here, come to our woodwinds, and I'm going to come and find the clarinets. I think this ensemble sound is working nicely, so I'm going to choose this again here. And then what I'm going to do is to make sure that I'm choosing the right articulation. Okay, so clarinets can play lower than flutes. Let's see whether or not this range feels right for this viola part. Bit low, let's come up the octave again. Okay, and what we could also do would be to repeat our trick. We could try by restricting dynamics, maybe not as much this time, 75. I'm gonna give them all a little boost as well. Okay. when those flutes come through for that opera octave, isn't it? That's really working nicely. Okay, now what I also want to do definitely is to think about maybe providing some extra low end to the winds as well. And that's where my bassoons are going to come in. Now, so far what we've done is to use one part to generate another. In other words, I've copied the violins and the violas down to the flutes and to the clarinets. But this time what I'm going to do is to actually play a part live. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load these bassoons. Again, three of these. I'm enjoying this kind of ensemble sound. And for now, what we're going to do is to experiment with this idea of the, stac uh, the staccatissimo. Again, tricky word to say underneath the flutes and the clarinets. Now, it's just possible that we might also try a legato line here and see which one we prefer. But for now, what I'm going to do is to sort of flesh out the harmony at the low end of the woodwind range using these bassoons, which are going to give us the kind of nice bassy low end. And again, I'm focusing on the moment when the flutes expand and go up the octave as well as playing their core notes. So effectively, at this point, as the flutes go up, the bassoons are going to come in and provide us with this weight and this little classic sort of arrangement technique that what we do is to stretch the frequencies in both directions at the same time. Sounds quite expansive and expensive. Okay, so what we're going to do is to try both things at once. Let's just do that now. So I'm going to just play in this bassoon part. But I'll try and hit the C on the bottom rather than the split note that I just did that time. Let's have a listen. Gusto. Okay, what does that actually sound like? Again, not quantized. Oh, 
Okay, and quantize. No, I'm joking. Okay, so what I am going to do is to quantize these because, you know, you know. But these are eights. And again, what I'm going to do is to use a quantized strength of no more than 70%. So again, repeating our trick of just making sure that some of my phenomenal feel uh, retains through uh, this part. Now, what I'm also going to do within the bassoons is just to make sure that from a velocity perspective, I'm just getting a little bit of articulation on each of these downbeats in particular. We want this overall sense of it climbing, and I like that. But nevertheless, I just want to make sure that each downbeat, we're really feeling that. I'm just going to give this an extra bar on the front as well, because I suspect this note's a little bit early. Okay, so that was a little bit machiney. So let's just do a little bit of extra programming here so that we don't get there too fast. Maybe something more like that. Now, one thing I am going to try is just a nice little way of swapping this articulation out for a long one. Instead of having all of these notes, what I'm going to do is to select all of the ones that come after the new note, if that makes sense. So I want the downbeat on each new note, but what I'm going to do is to get rid of the other ones. I'm going to select all of them. I'm going to make them all, apart from this very last note, force legato, which basically means they're going to last until the next note takes over. I'm going to come back into here and I'm going to swap my articulation back over to a legato patch. What does that sound like? So now what we've got is a sustained um, bassoon rather than a um, staccatissimo one. Let's see what that sounds like in the context of the woodwind mix overall. <laughs> Okay, and with everything. Quite like that. So what we've got now is this extra bit of weight that's coming through from the bassoons. Now, if you have been paying attention to this series, you are also once again screaming at YouTube. What are you screaming? Well, you're absolutely right. Now that we're into a long articulation, I need to be thinking about modulation and expression data. In my shorts, velocity is controlling the volume of these notes. But if I want my bassoons to feel like they make musical sense, I'm now going to need my good friends, uh, my excellent friends. We holiday together every year, modulation and expression. So what I'm going to do is to give a little bit of articulation to the start of this note. It's then going to drop away a little bit and it's going to rise up to the end. Now, what you're also thinking is, shouldn't that be a short note? Well, yeah, it should, for sure. I'm going to see if I can get away with it because I haven't yet created an articulation map for my woodwinds. Shame on me. Okay, but if I did do that, I would turn that into a staccatissimo note. I'm going to just keep it there for now and we'll pretend it never happened. So there's my modulation line. And then what I'm going to do is to create an expression line as well. And I'm going to more or less have that map the same thing. I think I'm going to want a little bit of a crescendo to the end. Actually doesn't sound too bad, does it? So really have got away with that. Again, I want a little bit more, just kind of push on the front of this note, just so we really hear it kind of arrive. So it's more of a kind of marcato start. I'm actually going to have those notes overlap a little bit so that we just get a little bit more smoothness. So we're bringing together loads of the techniques that we've looked at, but we obviously don't yet have reverbs for this because we haven't set up a reverb for the woodwind. So that's something we're going to need to bear in mind. So for now, we've got some woodwinds that are feeling quite nice and they're working in a, in a nice way. But another thing we could potentially do would be to add some oboes. Again, we can think about whether or not we want those to be shorts or longs. Potentially what they could do would be to pick out I don't know, we could even try putting the melody from the first violins on the oboes. Let's just do that before we move on to brass. I'm going to just open this uh, interface up one more time. And again, what I'm going to do is to select the core version. Let's come down here. We obviously haven't loaded these sounds yet, so let's come and find our oboe. But what I might do, I'm 
experimenting, thinking in my mind about section sizes. We could try this as a solo oboe. Why not? Nothing to lose. And what we're going to do is to come and grab our first violin line and copy it here. Change its name. Change its colour. In fact, the bassoons are an odd colour. Hmm. Let's make them all the right colour. And let's just come back to the oboes for a moment. And again, let's just think about range. I think these are going to be okay, actually. Hmm. It's amazing the sort of tone and the sort of feel of different instruments. If this were, I don't know, 20 BPM slower and this was our solo instrument, it would be a completely different piece of music. It's got amazingly kind of mournful quality to it. Um, all the oboists amongst you will be screaming now saying it's not a mournful sound because um, they hate that badge, understandably so. But it does have that kind of melodic shape, this particular tune. Let's put that in with everything else. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do with this oboe line, which I like, is I'm going to take out the first two phrases. So I'm going to just mute those notes so that effectively it picks up the first violin line for the sort of uh, the end section. Okay, that was woodwinds. New chapter. Okay, so let's look at some brass as well. Now, we're not going to go nuts here. It's not a piece for the big trumpets, I don't think. But it might be nice to think about fleshing out the kind of chords of this with both some trombones and with some horns. So what I'm going to do is to come down to the brass stack. Again, I'm going to discover that, of course, they are existing as tracks, if not yet loaded. And what we'll do is come and find the sounds for these. So I might indulge myself and come back to the kind of pro versions of this library for the brass, just to kind of show you that there are two different interfaces depending on which version of this library you have, indeed, if you have it at all. Um, so what I'm going to do is to stay here, and what we'll do is to come and find some trombones. So I'm going to come down to the brass, which are here, and I'm going to use the tenor trombones. Now, again, there are three players. Now, what I'm going to do here, again, is one of those things which is potentially a little bit cheaty in a way, which is that I'm going to play three notes at a time. So effectively, I'm imagining that each of those notes has been assigned to one player. But in reality, of course, it means that all three of the players who are at the session for the sampling of this are playing all three notes. Again, in practice, the only way around that would be to load the solo trombonist three times and to give each of those parts its own note, but I'm not sure that's any more real. The same player playing the same instrument, hmm, you have to make your own decision about that. Ideally, of course, what you're going to do is to print out a score of your piece and go and hire an orchestra and have it played live, and that will sound amazing. But for now, that's just a little thing to be thinking about. So here are our long um, tenor trombones. Range. Ooh. Was that the best thing that happened today? Of course it was. Okay, so what we're gonna do is think a little bit about our harmony again. Remember what we're sort of doing in terms of fleshing this out is to think about the kind of back end of this piece really sort of taking off. So again, I think my harmony does a kind of... thing in the back end. So let's just record something in and see if we need to fix some notes afterwards. Okay, let's hope I've remembered that correctly. You know what? That should last all the way through to the end, shouldn't it? Okay, so let's fix that for a start. So I'm going to turn this track on. Weirdly, even though I can load the sound for it, that doesn't automatically turn on the channel, so I need to bear that in mind. Otherwise, it won't play back. Next thing, I, I am going to sort of just quantize these and make sure that these chords are all in time. And then what I'm going to do before um, we go any further is to extend this all the way through to the end of this chord. Fine. Now then, first thing to say is that... Quite regularly, I hear mock-ups of orchestral music, and I think to myself, could the brass players really play that long without taking a breath? 
And that's the first thing you really need to bear in mind. Let's suppose this phrase was 16 bars long and all of the notes joined together. I need to be a bit careful because the louder brass players play, the more air they require to generate those notes, which means the less time those notes can sustain before they need to breathe in. I want you to imagine like this. If you make a bra brass player breathe for too long, they're going to die. It'll be your fault. Your fault. So we need to be that, bear that in mind. Now, it sounds like quite an odd thing to do. And as you can probably hear from my tone of voice, I've got a little bit of a cold at the moment. So this is going to be even harder. But what we almost need to do is to check that we can expel air for the length of time that the phrase that we have programmed lasts for. So what I'm actually going to do, even though it's going to sound a bit weird, is to try that right now. I'm going to take a deep breath and breathe out through these notes and just check I can get to the end of bar seven without having turned red in the face. <sighs> I can. And the great thing is that most brass players are kind of like Olympic swimmers and they've got amazing lung capacity. So here I'm OK. But if it were the case that this was a much longer phrase, I need to think a little bit about how I might break this. And musically, it might be a good idea for me to do that anyway. So I'll show you what I mean. If I was to select this chord here, what I could do would be to chop it right here and again here, and I might just decide to build a little beat of rest into this moment, which would give everyone a chance to take a breath, and it will actually help place that last chord, because suddenly it will feel like it's got a little pause before it, before that happens. So don't be in too much of a hurry to join all of these notes up, says Jono, who is about to join all of these notes up. So for these ones here, I am gonna make sure that these notes just ever so slightly overlap, so that we get that kind of really joined up sound, which sounds like this. Actually, I think that shape's really nice and it gives everyone a chance to breathe. Great. No one's died today. Okay, now, of course, these are long notes, which means, again, I need to think about modulation and expression. You didn't need me to say that. You knew that was true already. I, again, want a little bit of that effect that we have with the bassoons, which is that we get a nice little bit of articulation on the front, then it drops away a little bit, and then maybe it all crescendos up to this enormous raspy ending. Okay, and we might do the same thing again, sort of with um, expression two. I'm just going to use this to set the overall volume, and then maybe we can just have it just drop a little bit here before um, it rises again. Let's have a listen. That sounds horrible. Let's just do this a little bit better. Trial and error, you see? You never know until you know, and then you know. That also sounds horrible. So I'm going to really massively decrease the amount that I'm drawing these lines so that we just get a little bit of shape, but not nearly as much. And then you know. Okay. Okay, so this part overall is too loud. I like the kind of um, modulation, the, the samples that we're calling on and the sort of strength of those. But what I'm gonna do is to bring down the um, expression data, which of course is controlling overall volume. Now, of course I could do that with a fader, but I'm trying to do as much of it with MIDI as I can because the mix is all gonna come later. <laughs> Okay, and maybe I might just take the very end of that down a little bit, just so it doesn't go all the way through to the end. Okay, so that's working nicely. What we might also do around that would be to arrange some horns. Last part we're gonna put in. So I'm going to just come and find my plug-in one more time. This time we're gonna come down to the French horns. So let's just come again into the brass and we'll come and find the horns and uh, am I having a moment of blindness? Yes, I am. There we are. Okay, so there are my horns, four of those. And again, we're going to want the longs. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that before I just select this and just flesh this arrangement out as we have done with the trumpets, uh, the trombones, I should say, 
Obviously, we also do have a legato extended um, uh, articulation for these sounds too, which of course gives us a chance to do that really strident melodic thing. And before we move into a more chordy thing, what I'm going to do is to borrow my first violin line one more time with all of its preloaded um, expression and modulation. Again, just rename it for a second and make it the right colour so that we have a chance just to see what this sounds like if the French horns play the melody. Again, I might need to be a little bit mindful of key range, but we'll see. Uh, let's just solo this. So sure enough, this is right at the upper end of what the French horns can play. So let's just drop it the octave for a moment, let's take it down an octave. Ooh. So that's one thing we could do, but actually I do like the idea of just even more kind of force in the sort of extended version of that. But remember, once you've written the parts that you've written, it's worth just thinking a little bit about how they might double across a number of different instruments. So now what I've got is four French horns. So once I've played, it's almost uh, four calling birds, three French hens, four French horns, three trombones, two piccolos. Okay, so we've got our French horns, but what I'm going to do is to play a four note chord. So, again, thinking about our range, let's have a look here. Okay, look, let's bring these up so we can actually hear this. players okay so you can begin to see how unnatural it sounds when we sustain a chord like this for age i mean it's you know it's irresistible because it sounds so good but remember yeah that's not what would happen in in the real world okay so what i'm going to do is just to kind of flesh this arrangement out put in our um, french horns as well again just under these chords at the end <laughs> forget to sustain that last note. So again, what we're going to do is quantize those, make them longer at the beginning, come and find this last chord, extend it out. And what we'll do as we did with the other brass parts is I'm going to just make sure I build in a little rest there because it's nice to have that. And actually for these parts, it might sound a bit weird that they're not doing the same thing as the others. But what I'm going to do is just to make these just a little bit more articulated with just a little bit more gap between them. It'd be quite interesting to hear that. Quite like that. So we're going to set our expression learning a little bit from our trombones. And what we're going to do here as well is just add our modulation lines as well. Again, we won't go too nuts here. I think a quite consistent sound might not be so bad, but maybe we'll just allow ourselves a little crescendo into the end. Well, that's quite big, isn't it? It's going to be fruity at the end, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, a bit too much, perhaps. Now, the other thing it's worth bearing in mind is that I could as well put a curve on this automation line. So this is the automation curve tool. So if I want that crescendo to be less linear, I have a chance, obviously, just to manipulate it. This is another really useful way of just making sure that things don't sound too sort of progressive and it also means that the kind of fade up through here is just going to curve a little bit later. Okay now of course the next thing I could do would be to add my reverbs for the different buses. We know how to do that, select those tracks, set up new auxiliaries and make sure they're just assigned in and then added to those track stacks. But what we've done in this fourth part is to sort of see how we can take the musical ideas that were written for the strings and apply them 
to some other sort of orchestral sections. So we've got a kind of foolish woodwind section. We haven't got any trumpets or any tuba, but we have got trombones and French horns. And what we've done is to give all of this extra power and weight to this piece of music. It's got a kind of more regal feel to it now, a bit more dramatic, particularly towards the end. Now, of course, there are a number of ways you can add these parts. You can record everything live. If you want independent parts for each thing, great, go and do that. Try all these things out. Remember, definitely experiment with the number of players you want playing these lines as well. Solo flute, ensemble flute, well, apply that approach to all of these sections just to try out exactly how it feels to move from one thing to another. And that's the other thing to say. You might decide that for the first part of this flute line, a solo player is enough, and then open up the ensemble towards the back end. All of the individual sounds themselves will sound subtly different, but you add them together in an ensemble context for full orchestra and it will sound massive or tiny, depending on what it is that you want. So across these four parts, we've gone from not really understanding anything about the way that orchestral programming can exist for libraries like this, to putting together a short piece of music for a whole range of instruments. We've arranged them into a template, we've set up, or at least we know how to set up effects for them as well. There's loads you can do now with the knowledge across these four separate videos, I hope.